Welcome to 106 Theoretical Physics Colloquium by Professor Thomas Browner from the University of Stavanger, Norway. Uh, he received his PhD at Charles University in Prague, which is uh, one of the oldest universities in Europe. Uh, he had several postdoctoral positions after that <clears throat> at uh, Goethe University in Frankfurt, Bielefeld University, University of Helsinki, and Vienna University of Technology. Since 2015, he was an associate professor at the University of Stavanger, and since 2016, he's a full professor there. Over the years, he received several awards. In 2006, he received Milan Odenal uh, Award for, uh, of the Czech Physical Society. And in 2020, he received Lice Research Award for outstanding research uh, work at the University of Stavanger. His research interests include symmetries, the spontaneous symmetry breaking, unusual forms of spontaneous symmetry breaking, effective field theory, field theory at non-zero temperature and density, phenomenology of strong and electroweak interactions, astroparticle physics, cosmology, and even condensed matter physics. And today he will be talking about inhomogeneous dense matter in strong magnetic fields. And with that, I'll give the microphone to uh, Thomas. Thanks a lot for this introduction, Igor, and uh, thank you for for the invitation to give this talk in the first place. So I hope you can now all see my screen. So we are on track, and uh, so let's uh, let's get started. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I'll try to divide this talk roughly into three parts. Let's see how the timing works out. So in a in the first part, I'll basically show you just some pictures. Well, I'll try to motivate why it's interesting to look at inhomogeneous states of dense matter. Uh, in the second part, uh, I will then go through some details of some basic uh, basic ideas uh, that uh, that uh, that I worked on, started working on about five years ago. And then in the last part, I'll try to flesh some more recent developments uh, in a kind of a review review style. But let me start with, uh, with introduction. Uh, this talk is supposed to be about dense matter. So what is dense matter? What do I mean by that? Uh, well, if you ask a practitioner, a theoretical physicist, probably they might imagine something of this sort here, like the pictures that you that you see here, depending on which specialization you have. Um, if you ask a lake person what, how they would imagine what dense matter is, especially if they live in Norway, then they might have in mind something of this sort. Um, this is this is what you find in one particular park in Oslo, by the way. Uh, well, I'm I'm showing you here these images just uh, to motivate the next slide, because when we when we start learning quantum field theory, we start learning how to describe finite density matter in quantum field theory. Basically, implicitly, the textbooks ask the textbooks ask us to picture something like this, right? It's almost always implicitly assumed that whatever ground state you're dealing with in a quantum in the local quantum field theory is uniform pretty much in any textbook on quantum field theory. And whenever some kind of structure or inhomogeneity or non-uniformity non arises, it requires a particular mechanism to justify. So uniformity or homogeneity is the natural state of matter. Uh, and of course, the, 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 the need to justify the, the, the the emergence of structure underlies some very profound problems in physics. So here is just a snapshot of the of the uh, of the evolution of the universe, where, as you know, this is one of major problems to explain where the structure in the universe comes from. So, so this motivates the question that I have here: that is, uh, if uniform is natural, then do we have some particular mechanisms or some some natural ways how how inhomogeneous structures can appear in the ground state of quantum matter? or some quantum system. So what I'll try to do on the next few slides is to give you a, a, a quick review of generic known mechanisms, how you can get some inhomogeneity in a, in a quantum system, quantum many body system. So let me start with, with one here. So this is uh, 1D here refers not to the dimensionality of the system, but to the, to the number of dimensions in which your your state is modulated okay so so let's think of the bcs theory of superconductivity in the simplest incarnation that we know what you find is that you have two spin polarizations of electrons let's say up and down and they are paired with total momentum zero uh, you have ordinary s wave pairing uh, this is uniform a way to get a non-uniformity in uh, for instance, superconductors or in Fermi gas 
this is if you if you pair two types of fermions which have unequal Fermi surfaces, because then energetically it's favorable to pair fermions which which sit on the mutual respective Fermi surfaces, but that implies automatically that the total momentum of a Cooper pair that you get in this way when you have an imbalance of Fermi surfaces is automatically non-zero, and that translates in a coordinate space to a plane wave kind of pattern. So that's one type of very generic mechanism how you can get a non-uniform structure. Another is here. So this is this is a kind of uh, a very naive snapshot of what one sees is so-called chiral magnets. Again, this is 1D. Okay. And so imagine imagine the arrows here as being the, the direction of local magnetization in some spin system, like in a ferromagnet. And there's a there is a particularly interesting uh, class of materials where because of the lack of parity of the underlying crystal structure. Uh, the, the ferromagnetic order is not uniform, but it becomes twisted, like in a kind of helix, what I try to show here. Again, this is a generic mechanism that you can think of writing down kind of Ginzburg-Landau theory, where you have a vector order parameter, M here, that stands for magnetization, but it can be any vector order parameter, and you need to break parity, and that allows you to add this kind of term into the into the free energy, which is called zelozinski moria and being first or, first order in derivatives. It necessarily drives your system into some non-uniform, non-uniform order. Um, now we go to 2D. So these are some known pictures. If you if you go, uh, if you have a Bose-Einstein condensate, for instance, that you subject to rotation, then you can get then you can get a abricots of sorry, then you can get the abricots of lattice of vortices here. So you get you get structure with you get an emergent lattice with a structure, lattice spacing, which is much longer than the underlying, you know, length scale of your system. Uh, similar thing, one can see that you can see this in uh, in uh, superconductors in external magnetic field or in rotating Bose-Einstein condensate. There will be this image. Uh, there will be more, but I I'm I'm not pretending to give you a full list of different types of mechanisms. Uh, but just to some examples, there will be more of them. You can have skirmion lattices in ferromagnets or antiferromagnets. You can have super solid type of order. And last but not least, and this is what I try to focus on in the rest of my talk, you can have some inhomogeneous order in dense nuclear matter. And there are different types of order that, that inhomogeneous that were proposed uh, to, uh, to exist in the phase diagram of QCD. Uh, I'll focus on one particular uh, qualitatively new type of order, which is different from all those I've shown you until now. Um, so, okay, here is a basic reminder because now we are switching from the from the kind of cartoon uh, cartoon part of the talk into talking about uh, dense quark matter. So here's the reminder of the QCD phase diagram. Um, this is of course pretty familiar here. I'm sorry. Here is the baryon chemical potential on the horizontal axis, not uh, not density. Okay, baryon chemical potential. And I'm just showing to you to to stress that everything I'm going to talk about in this talk pretty much corresponds to matter that sits somewhere here. Okay, so the below the onset of ordinary nuclear matter. Uh, so where normally at a zero temperature at least we expect nothing, we expect vacuum. Okay, so all the, I'll show you uh, in a moment that there is a phase in a phase diagram of QCD. Uh, which displays baryon matter in that it carries baryon number and it sits somewhere here where you don't have any nucleons. And in order to have such such phase of QCD, one needs an extra ingredient and that's a strong enough magnetic field. So uh, this is again just a motivational slide to remind you that we have have such strong magnetic fields, perhaps, well, we have strong magnetic fields both in heavy ion collisions and in neutron stars. So that's the that's two images here. Uh, somehow they appear, they end up to be visually rather similar, but it doesn't, that's not supposed to have a deeper meaning, okay? Um, so here's the, here I start with the result, okay? Uh, the, that goes back to 2017. So that's the initial work on the new phase of QCD called CSL, that is the chiral soliton lattice. So here is here is a phase diagram of QCD. Uh, the vertical axis is magnetic field. You know the scale here, okay? If you translate this to Gauss, this is, you talk about fields of, of the order of 10 to 19 Gauss. So these are fields which are of course pretty strong by everyday standards. On the other hand, they are below the scale of QCD and that's important. And on the horizontal axis, we have the chemical potential. And as I promised to you, 
this is below the onset of all the nuclear matter. That's why on purpose here, I end the horizontal axis here somewhere around, around 900 MeV, okay? So, so normally you would expect vacuum. However, so the, the, the main result, the first main result I'm gonna show you, explain to you is that there is a new phase, chiral soliton lattice. I'll explain why chiral and why soliton, but already now I can tell you that that phase carries a condensate of neutral pions. And that condensate carries a non-zero baryon number. So, so this is this is really matter in the sense that it carries baryon number, but it's not the ordinary nuclear matter. All right, so let's uh, let's get started. Uh, where does this come from? That's that's the second part of my talk where I try to explain to you what the, the origin of this phase in the phase diagram of QCD. Perhaps I should mention now, I'm I'm saying phase diagram of QCD, but everything I'll do will be obtained in low energy effective field theory of QCD, that is the chiral perturbation theory, which means it's model independent, okay? So in that sense, one can, one can say that this is a, a particular corner of the phase diagram of QCD itself. All right, um, so uh, in order to build some basic details, I need to uh, make another reminder. This is for anybody who is practitioner in QCD. This is, of course, pretty trivial, but I'm ju I just wasn't sure beforehand what exactly the audience would be. So I, I kindly ask the experts in the audience for for a little patience. Okay. Uh, well, the basic ingredient that we that we need is the isospin symmetry in nuclear matter, and that goes back to Heisenberg. The idea that uh, you have an SU2 type symmetry in nuclear matter, where in the modern formulation of QCD that's embedded in the chiral symmetry, where you have two flavors of the lightest quarks, U and D, and when they are massless, you get SU2 and SU2 acting separately on the left and right, and it works. Now in the ground state of QCD, that symmetry is spontaneously broken down to the ordinary isospin, that the Heisenberg isospin, and that leads to the existence of three, three Golson bosons, which we now are able to identify with pions. So the fact that the pions are not exactly massless is because the symmetry is not exact, but is broken by the quark masses explicitly. But we understand the relationship between pion masses and quark masses very well. So there is no doubt that pions are pseudo Golson bosons of this symmetry. Um, so everybody who has experience with effective field theory then, then says hooray, because once we have a spontaneously broken symmetry, we know how to describe, uh, describe low energy dynamics of such a system in a more independent way, even if the underlying dynamics is strongly coupled, such as in QCD. Uh, the low energy dynamics is weakly coupled, and it's it can be described by an effective theory of the pions only as a, as a theory living on the SU2 manifold, that is the coset space of broken symmetry. So you just need an SU2 valued matrix field that I call sigma here. And here's a, here is the effective Lagrangian where the capital D here means uh, this is a kinetic term. And here you have a bit which brings in the explicit breaking of chiral symmetry by the quark masses. So this would be the leading order effective Lagrangian of the so-called chiral perturbation theory, leading order in the derivative expansion. Now I'm not gonna work with all this. I will not need a whole SU2 valued field. Uh, I will, because remember that we want to talk about strong magnetic fields. Now, strong magnetic fields, what they do is that whenever you have charged particles, they lead to Landau level quantization of the energy levels. And out of the three pions that we have, two of them are charged. And so they become heavy. They get a gap of the order of square root of B. Uh, uh, and so in sufficiently strong magnetic fields, but still weaker than the QCD scale, what's left in the low energy spectrum will be just the neutral pions. So this whole thing just boils down to an effective theory for a single real field, which is a neutral pion field, and that's my phi here. I just rescaled it to be dimensionless. So the phi, you can think of it as a, as a phase that sits in the original, in the original SU2 valued matrix. Okay, it's a, it's a dimensionless, dimensionless field that's uh, that's a complex phase essentially. So this is this is the leaning order effective Lagrangian for the neutral pion only. And this is should be pretty familiar because if you if, at least if you restrict yourself to one plus one dimension, this is basically the Lagrangian of a sine Gordon model. And that 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 that'd be pretty that play a very important role in what I'm what I'm gonna tell you. Thomas um, well we'll was there a question? Yes there is a quick question I have. Yes um, please when you have a strong magnetic field, in principle, you may need to introduce pi u and pi d as two separate quantities. Uh, you seem to have only one of them. Uh, is that a limitation? 
so I assume that the magnetic field is well below the QCD scale. Right, so I, I introduce it as a, as a, if you want, an adiabatic perturbation on into the effective theory without any magnetic field. Okay. So that the, you know, the set of degrees of freedom that you have, that's, that's fixed in the vacuum, right? You have just the three pions. And as long as the magnetic field, that should be okay, as long as the magnetic field doesn't distort the ground state too much. And I'll show you uh, uh, later, I'll explain that uh, the, the CSL phase, the chiosoliton lattice phase, in principle, at least if you think of a quark mass as a tunable parameter, and if you tune 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 it close enough to chiral limit, then uh, even arbitrarily weak magnetic field will trigger the, the CSL phase. Okay. So in that sense, still the, the you know, predictions of, of the effect theory based on the neutral pions field only are, are safe. Okay. So the, 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 thanks for the question, because it may be relevant for some of the a more recent ramification that I'll talk about later, but uh, I, I, if I remember, I'll try to get back to that. Okay. Thanks. So th there's one more thing we're going to need uh, and that's, that we have to add to this uh, leading order effective Lagrangian, and that's the effects of the chiral anomaly. Um, I will not show you the, uh, what, what you have to do to chiral perturbation theory in full glory, uh, because we're not going to need the whole thing. I'll just remind you the basics that, that we learn in quantum field theory. And that is uh, one peculiar consequence of chiral anomaly is that neutral pions couple to electromagnetic fields in an unusual way. And the, the anomaly is responsible for the decay of the neutral pions to a pair of photons. So this is like the, the uh, thing that one learns about anomalies when in, in, you know, in introductory courses on quantum field theory. What's well, slightly less well known, but it it has is based on exactly the same mechanism. Is that pion fields can also carry baryon number, uh, and that's after all. This is uh, the the idea goes back to Skirm, 1960, who proposed uh, to to model baryons as uh, solitons made out of pion fields. Um, so what you have to do that you have to add a so-called Westerminowitan term to the Lagrangian that I showed in the previous slide, and the the term represents, it implements the chiral anomaly of QCD in the effective Lagrangian of, Q, uh, of chiral perturbation theory for, for pions. Um, now, it, the whole thing is slightly ugly, but if you throw away the charged pions and you only keep the neutral pion field, uh, then what turns out to be left of it, and, and at the same time think of, of uh, a, a fixed uniform external magnetic field only, so no dynamical photons, what's left of the Vastumino with the term will be just one very, very, very simple term, and it looks like this, where mu is a baryon number chemical potential, b is my magnetic field, as said, and phi is the neutral pion field. Okay? So this just it just goes back to the same triangle anomaly that's responsible for the decay of the neutral pion into a pair of photons, where you just in that triangle diagram you simply replace one of the electromagnetic fields with uh, with the baryon number current. Okay? So it's the same triangle, same type of triangle anomaly. Where, where is the charge? The, oh, sorry, the, I, I absorb the electric charge into the definition of B. I see. Yeah, because my magnetic fields are fixed, uh, okay, fixed okay. background. I treat them as a fixed background. Uh, so what, th what this is really, and I switched also already to Hamiltonian uh, here, that this is this is a Hamiltonian of the sine Gordon model. That's the black part to which I added the effect of the anomaly, which happens to be a topological term. Because if you if you do an integration by parts here and put this nabla here on the B, then because the B is divergence less, you find out that this actually is just a surface term. Being a surface term, it doesn't affect the equation of motion. Uh, so if you want to find now the ground state of this, and I, I tried to justify previously that finding the ground state of this means finding the ground state of QCD in, in, in uh, let's say, moderately strong magnetic fields. Well, what you, what you can do is that you solve the equation of motion and, then, and look for the solution, which is the minimum energy. And the advantage of dividing the analysis in these two steps is that you can ignore the anomaly term in, in, at first because it doesn't affect the equation of motion. So you find the equation of motion for the, coming from the sine Gordon Lagrange and sine Gordon Hamiltonian, but that's just the equation of a pendulum, really. You have a cosine type of potential and you have a kinetic term. In one dimension, this just boils down to the equation of a pendulum. And so the, the, the solutions to that are known and you can, you can express them analytically in terms of so-called Jacobi elliptic functions. 
I'll not bother you with some explicit analytic formulas. I'll just show you some pictures here. Um, so now think of phi, really think of the analogy with pendulum. So my pine field, as said, is a phase. So think of it as a phase, as the angle by which the pendulum rotates. So now we are not interested in solutions of the equation of motion for pendulum, which correspond to oscillations, but we are, we are interested in solutions to the equation of motion, which correspond to, to, to winding of the angle. So it, think of like you kick the pendulum strongly enough so that it gets to the, it has enough energy to get to the, to the highest point and it keeps going. So this is, this is what you get. So here's, the, here's your phase as a function now of, of coordinate. And you have an infinite class of solutions, which are which are parameterized by a single parameter that's called elliptic modulus. Usually it's called a little k and it takes values between zero and one. And if you interpolate between, between these two limiting values, then k going to zero would correspond to uh, your, your pendulum having so much energy that you can basically neglect the gravity and it keeps going, going at constant speed. So there will be basically a straight line here. Whereas the limit of k going to one would, would correspond to a situation where you give your pendulum just enough energy to reach the top where it nearly stops and then, then slowly passes by and keeps and goes on. So in that case, in the limit of k going to one, you get kind of plateaus where your pendulum nearly stops, then it quickly swings through the lowest point, then another plateau where it nearly stops and so on. Uh, an interesting thing to look at is the gradient of this solution. And that's because on the previous slide, I showed you that here in, we have a bit in a Hamiltonian which looks like mu times something. And that just means that that something has the meaning of the corresponding charge density. And since mu is the baryon number chemical potential, this bit here, B dot nabla phi divided by four pi square has the physical interpretation as a baryon number density. So if you look at the gradient of the solutions and you see the kind of um, do domain-like structure, especially for the, for the solutions, which have like a plateau here and then quickly swing through, the, through, through some point and the plateau again, you find peaks in baryon number density separated by regions where you have basically no baryon number. And so you can think of you can think of such solutions as a stack of domain walls, which are stacked on top of each other. Now, of course, I have showed you, I'm showing you a class of solutions, and then the question arises: which of these is the ground state? Well, for that, you just have to evaluate the energy of the solutions and plug it back to the Hamilton and C. And the answer is that one can find what the ground state is implicitly. So the optimal value of the elliptic modulus is implicitly related to the baryon chemical potential and magnetic field by this simple formula. Well, which is simple enough if you remember this capital E is the complete elliptic integral of the second kind. Maybe it'd be difficult to imagine what that really says. So here's here is the, the the value of the elliptic modulus in the ground state as a function of, of this combination here. So mu times B divided by some constant, okay? So what happens is that at certain critical value of magnetic field, which corresponds to this combination being equal to one, you, you for the first time start to see these topologically non-trivial winding solutions as the actual ground state of your system. At that point, when that happens, k equals to one, that corresponds to a single domain wall. So you have a, you have kind of periodic solution where the lattice spacing of the of the solution goes to infinity. But when you further increase the magnetic field, so this goes from one, this becomes bigger than one, then the lattice spacing of your periodic solution quickly drops. So, so let me show you again the, the picture I started with. This is the phase diagram once again. Um, the critical magnetic field above which the non-trivial non soliton lattice starts being a ground state of QCD, that's, the, that's this black thick line here. And this line is shown here for the physical value of pi and mass, that is 140 MeV. Uh, but you see in what I showed you here, that, well, when you when you tune the pi and mass down to zero, then the critical magnetic field will also go down to zero. In other words, if you try to draw this phase diagram and uh, see how, how, the, how the phase, how the 
location of this phase transition depends on the pion mass. If you decrease the pion mass, it will go all the way down to zero. And that's why, as I said before, uh, in principle, an arbitrarily weak magnetic field is sufficient to trigger the onset of the soliton lattice carrying a spatially modulated condensate of neutral pions. Uh, now, something interesting happens somewhere up here. It turns out that as long as you trust chiral perturbation theory, and that's a question whether you actually should or you shouldn't, but as long as you trust the chiral perturbation theory, still at chemical potentials and fields that are somewhere up here, it turns out that at this upper thick black line, the soliton that is solution I'm just showing to you becomes unstable uh, because the charged pions become tachyonic at this line. And it appears that there should be some farther phase transition to some far, to some to some yet other phase, even more exotic, which should carry a mixture of condensates of neutral and charged pions. There's a very interesting recent paper by Andras Schmidt and, and his PhD student, Gerent Evans, who took our work seriously and they looked at what happens just around this transition. And they argue that what happens here is basically onset of kind of type two superconductivity where you get abricots of vortex lattice of charged pions except that it's kind of inverted to what you normally see in type two superconductors, because what you normally see in type two superconductors is that uh, you first trigger the abricots of vortex lattice of vortices, and then sufficiently strong magnetic field will kill, uh, kill the superconduct superconducting order altogether. Instead, what you, what you find here is that you need sufficiently strong magnetic field to bring you to the vortex lattice from uniform state to a vortex lattice in the first place. So this is the result that's published earlier this year. Uh, if if anybody is wondering why, I'm sh why I have two lines here, so let me let me answer that question right away without anybody ask without anybody asking. So the thick black line here, that's that's uh, an exact numerical solution obtained in for the physical pion mass 140 MeV. The dashed thin line here, that's the same type of onset of charge pion condensation in the current limit. So you see that the pion mass here. Uh, pion mass here actually plays very little role, and that's simply because we are in the range, of, in the region of magnetic fields, which are much bigger than pi squared here. So that's why go, going close to chiral limit here doesn't really make much of a difference. On the other hand, for this onset down here, going close to chiral limit really brings this transition all the way down to zero. Uh, so this is a brief question. Yes. Can, can I ask yes, please. Question? Do I understand correctly that this one dimension of is a long B? Exactly. Direction, Sorry, direction I forgot to stress that, but absolutely, beat. absolutely, yeah, and okay. one can see why here, yeah, because yeah, okay, you have okay. you see here that that you know you want the gradient of phi to be a long b to really minimize the energy. Okay. Thank yeah, you. Thanks. Okay. So, um, so this is uh, this is pretty much uh, the end of the second part of my talk when I wanted to take you through some details of where this chiral soliton lattice phase in the phase diagram of QCD comes from. You see that mathematically, one doesn't really need much that, much more than, than, than the pendulum equation. Uh, that was all work done in, back in 2016, 17. So now in the remaining time that I have, I want to briefly take you through some more recent results which basically, which basically built on this. Uh, so one thing that you might be wondering about already at this stage is, yeah. So, well, sorry. yes, Thomas, can I ask a quick question about yes, this uh, uh, new phase here, this upper course of vortex lattice? This reminds me um, a little bit to the uh, claim to, you know, Maxine Chernodop had this idea that uh, uh, QCD vacuum becomes a superconductor in a strong magnetic field. Is this related to this or is this something different? Can you do during um, no, uh, I don't think it's directly related. So in this case, it was about, uh, uh, I don't think he wanted to have a vortex lattice in the first place. So he just was thinking of how how the Landau levels look for, for higher spin particles, right? So he was thinking about about um, the uh, the spectrum of the Romasons right. and, and show that the, 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 the energy- not pion. Yeah, exactly, rho condensate, yes. So, uh, in, in, he, he argued that you can get a rho condensate in sufficiently strong magnetic field. And then I, I believe that if you just did a detailed analysis, it showed that the actual ground state would be, it would be a vortex lattice. Mm -hmm. So in this case, we are still talking about a condensate of scalars, uh, char ordinary charge scalars 
also what's mm -hmm. really essential here in his case the you know the basic qualitative argument really was just landau level quantization for free particles uh, whereas what what we have here is really depends essentially on the anomaly and it's it's pretty weird why you should get a condensation of charge points in the first place because exactly the lambda level quantization should make the charge points very heavy and the stronger you make the magnetic field the, the heavier the charge points should become well the 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 interesting thing is that once once you add on top of the lambda levels you add the effect of a car anomaly it turns out that the effect that the the magnetic field dependence of the charge point spectrum Sort of it turns back. So at, at some point when the magnetic field keeps growing, the Carl anomaly kind of wins over the Landau level quantization and the, the, the mass or the gap of charged pions starts decreasing again. And it's it's very interesting because it's very unusual, right? No, you wouldn't expect you would expect normally charged particles to just go away <laughs> when you crank up the magnetic field, but here the chiral anomaly it 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 overweighs the effect of the Landau level quantization. And at some point, the, it pushes the, the gap of charged pions down to zero. So this would really would be a second order phase transition where, where the charged pions become tachyonic. Uh, I don't really see, you know, when it comes to these details, I don't see much of an analogy with what, uh, with what Maxim okay. did. Also, in his case, you know, it was, it was all in a vacuum, right? So there was no matter. Yeah, yeah that's right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. So he, uh, yeah. Mm. It's an interesting question. Uh, I'm, I, don't, I don't know if there's any, uh, yeah. Okay, closer, thank closer you. Thanks. So, okay, the one thing that I want to mention next uh, is a kind of natural question that might arise, and that is, uh, well, so uh, I'm claiming here to to uh, that there is there is some new order which is non-uniform, which is modulated in one dimension, in one direction, and there turns out to be quite a general argument which forbids that kind of order. And in, in at least in the high energy community that goes under the folklore name of Landau Pyrrhus instability, uh, turns out that as long as you are in a rotationally invariant system, then in three spatial dimensions, then any order parameter that would be modulated in one direction only would be forbidden at any non-zero temperature. So this resembles a bit of the Mermin Wagner theorem, which prevents, uh, which forbids spontaneous symmetry breaking. And it, it basically boils down to the fact that um, if you have one dimensional modulation in, in your ground state of your system, then the, the, the spectrum of transverse fluctuations becomes so soft that the infrared fluctuations will kill the other parameter at any non-zero temperature. But that, that, that claim well, has never been proven rigorously as far as I know, so I don't want to call it a theorem, yeah, but, but that you claim... Didn't, you, you didn't address stability at all. You just have classical I, Yeah, stability. so that, that's my next slide. <laughs> so uh, next because slide. If, you, okay. if, you, if you want to ask what the you know, stability of this, then first you have to look at the spectrum of fluctuations. And of course, as since I mentioned now that you might have a problem at the non-zero temperature, you want to look at the thermal fluctuations. Um, but first, I will say that this uh, so-called anapyrus instability doesn't apply here directly because it only it is based on the assumption of non-zero, uh, oh, sorry, of rotational invariance, which here, of course, is broken by the magnetic field that we have. So mm -hmm. the, here is some more recent work, which actually was published only last year. That was together with Naoki Yamamoto and Helena Koleshova, who was my postdoc here in Stavanger. And we basically, what we did was we analyzed this same problem, but this time at next to leading order of the chiral perturbation theory. Now, next to leading order of chiral perturbation theory means that you, you are, we are calculating a free energy at one loop. Um, so far, we have not published results for the full chiral soliton lattice solution, but for only for the extreme case, corresponding to the onset here, that is the domain wall. So single domain wall. That's that's the that's the sort of critical state here at which the vacuum becomes unstable with respect to the CSL at this line. What you see is that the domain wall becomes stabilized. So what we did is basically take that domain wall solution and calculate uh, calculate one loop free energy on that domain wall background. So it's, it's not entirely trivial because you have a solitonic background in which you have to first find exactly the spectrum. It's possible because of this analogy with the sine Gordon model, the spectrum is known, it's a band spectrum for the, for the CSL state. Uh, one can calculate one loop free energy. Uh, it requires some work, but uh, we managed. And surprise, not only do the thermal fluctuations do not destabilize, 
the chiral solid lattice, they actually stabilize it even farther. And so that's uh, that I try to convey on this picture here. So this is the same type of phase diagram as I showed it before. So magnetic field on the vertical axis and chemical potential on the horizontal axis. The dashed line here, that's the original location of the phase transition I was showing here on the previous slide. So this one here. Okay, so that's the leading order result here. And then I have basically the same, lo we, we located where the transition is at next to leading order of the derivative expansion. The black line here, which is slightly hidden here, that's zero temperature, but next to leading order. So including one loop effects. And then you have this orange and blue lines correspond to some non-zero temperatures. Or orange is for 40 and, and blue is for 80 MeV. And the important effect, the important thing I want to point out to you is that as you see, when you crank up temperature, the location of the phase transition moves to the left. So it really it means that it takes lower magnetic field and lower chemical potential to, to trigger the onset of the CSL phase. And eventually this is actually not difficult to understand because you have the you have the two phases. Here you have a vacuum and here you have the CSL. In the vacuum, your excitation spectrum just you know contains usual pions, which have a mass of 140 MeV. Uh, and here in the CSL phase, well, you, you break spontaneous translation invariance. Uh, so you have a gapless mode there, which is a phonon. It's always there. It's always gapless exactly by the Goldstone theorem. And so, you know, when you calculate the thermal, the pressure of thermal fluctuations, here it's much easier to excite the low energy excitations because they're gapless. So the so this phase always wins. And that's why this is not ordinary second order phase transition. It's more like a topological type of phase transition. And the, the difference in the qualitative difference in excitation spectra causes the thermal fluctuations to further stabilize the state. Um, sorry, but it seems like you are turning around the uh, landau pyrrhos argument around. It was precisely because of those massless gapless modes that essentially uh, destroy the, uh, the, the position of your domain wall. And now somehow you are turning that around and saying it stabilizes. I'm not sure I understand. Right. So, okay. So the landau pyrrhos instability thing, I just wanted to mention, but it doesn't really apply here at all. But uh, uh, so the thing is that when you have rotation invariant system, the rotation invariance broken spontaneously by your one dimensional order forces the transverse fluctuations to have quadratic displacement relation so what you know what you find if you look at the spectrum uh, when you have one dimensional uh, one dimensionally modulated order parameter you find that typically you have some goldstone boson which is uh, which has linear dispersion relation along the modulation and a quadratic in the two transverse directions and it's that quadratic dispersion relation which really is the problem because it leads to strong infrared fluctuations yeah. and it leads to it leads to you know the usual kind of logarithmic singularity of the two point function at long distances at mm -hmm. any non zero temperature that's really mm -hmm. essential and you, one can show that that quadratic dispersion relation of the transverse fluctuations of the other parameter really is a consequence of of uh, breaking rotation uh, spontaneous breaking rotational invariance in our case the rotation invariance is broken by the magnetic field and when you, you can calculate again the spectrum exactly and you find that it's linear in all the directions. So you have, you know, you, you have just ordinary kind of phonon gas. You know, there's there's nothing wrong with uh, with thermal fluctuations in the CSL. It's just a phonon, it's just a gas of photons, if you want, with uh, with phase velocity that's somewhat that's slightly anisotropic. May uh, I depending may on I, the direction. May yes. I say something? Uh, mm -hmm. I you know, if you find stability, I, I am not surprised. I just wanted to make the comment that uh, have you been able to track that this instability that the stability is connected to the topology, because we found exactly the same. We have a, we studied a system of uh, the magnetic DCDW, which is inhomogeneous also and in, in a magnetic field, and it has a chiral anomaly contribution to the mm -hmm. to the theory. And when mm -hmm. you study the fluctuations we found that the soft mode in the transverse direction disappears precisely because of the topology contribution. Mm -hmm. How do we know? Because you can trace back and see that there are certain coefficients beta in the expansion of the fluctuations, uh, low energy theory, that would not exist unless you have topology, non-trivial mm -hmm. topology in your system. Okay. So right. I would Thanks. say, um, I don't know if you were able to, to trace the origin of uh, the stability, Mm -hmm. um, but I, I would say probably it's also related to the fact that you have a topology, non-trivial topology. In this okay. Mm -hmm. 
Thanks. Uh -huh. So, so first of all, no, I'm not saying that it's surprising that the face is stable. I just wanted to mention in case, you know, there was anybody in the audience who is aware of the Landau Pearls instability because that somehow that, for instance, affects the chiral density wave type of order that people have discussed quite, uh, quite vigorously in the context of QCD phase diagram because there you don't have a magnetic field, you really have isotropy. And so you shouldn't have such one dimensional modulation at any non-zero temperature. So, you know, this, this really affects uh, large parts of QCD phase diagram, at least a high phases that were conjectured to exist in large part of QCD phase diagram. So that's why I mentioned that, but it doesn't really apply to, to the problem that we are studying. And so I'm not saying that it's surprising that the Landau pulse instability is not there. <laughs> uh, uh, we were a bit surprised when we found that really the thermal fluctuations further stabilize the state. Uh, but uh, regard, uh, regarding your, your comment on the on the transfer fluctuations, um, uh, the transfer fluctuations are there and we have the spectrum explicitly. And we just find that in all the all three directions, the fluctuations have a linear, they are gapless and they have linear dispersion relation, which simply means that you don't have any kind of exactly. thermal instability. You don't have soft mode. Yeah. All of them are, not, none of them is soft. Right? That's what, uh, what do you mean by soft mode? No, well, linear is soft by definition. Yeah, exactly. So they are soft in the sense that they are gapless, but they have a well, linear yeah, dispersion Well, yeah, but rate. I mean soft in the sense that they are K4 instead of K square. Ah, no, oh, sure, sure, of course, yes. The energy is, energy is proportional to momentum. It's linear uh -huh. in momentum. Exactly, that's the that, key. That's our spectrum. The yeah. phase velocity only is, is some, somewhat anisotropic. Yeah. So it depends, of course, it's different along the magnetic exactly, field and exactly. in the transfer directions, but it's yeah, the energy exactly. is linear in momentum in all three directions. Yeah, it's the same thing yeah. in our case. So that's I'm what not I'm sure saying if that, I can. Yeah. yeah. No, I'm, I'm not sure I, I can just blame. I mention that I yeah. think that uh, it, the origin, uh, I would, I expect the origin would be the same. That is, is connected mm. to the non trivial topology of the spectrum that you have of the theory. Uh, I, I can't tell. I'm not sure. Uh, by default, I would think that it's uh, the, it should be connected to explicit breaking of rotation invariance by the magnetic field, but to what extent uh, the topology of the spectrum plays a role, I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't think the breaking of the, the rotation by the magnetic field is enough to ensure mm -hmm. that. So I okay. encourage you to explore mm -hmm. more Thanks. on that. Okay, let's okay. move on. Yes, thanks. So, okay, this was one follow-up work. Well, like if, if anybody's interested in details, actually this, this doing the one-loop calculation on the on the domain wall background is not entirely trivial. And if I can't show you the full analytic result because probably it wouldn't fit on one slide, but here is a particle limit that actually is very simple. And that is, uh, sorry, uh, here. So if you, if you go to the regime where the pi mass squared can be neglected compared to both temperature squared and the magnetic field. So it really is, you know, it's such small scale, close enough to chiral limit if you want. Then here's the, the red thing here, that's the next two leading order free energy. The nice thing is that it's entirely dependent on, is that entirely determined by the temperature and magnetic field. So there is no renormalization ambiguity here. Okay, this is this is free of any uh, renormalization ambiguities because it's it's a medium effect really. It depends on, on B and T, all these terms. And phi is that some function, which I'm not even showing to you what it is, but Numerically, it's uh, it depends. It's it's given by some moment of the Bose distribution. So, in one in one limit, it's exponential, exponentially suppressed. In another limit, it's some power law. Uh, okay, but yeah, uh, you can find more details in our paper down here. So that uh, that's that was published last year. So in the remaining, I don't know about ten minutes at most. Uh, that that I have, let me let me mention some further applications of the same ideas, uh, because. Uh, you might you might wonder whether you know magnetic fields of the order of nine, uh, one ten to nineteen Gauss are realistic. So once once you accept that possibly they might not be, uh, but still the phase diagram of QCD in strong magnetic fields is of interest anyway. Uh, well, you face the problem that you can't study it on the lattice if uh, heavy ion collisions and uh, neutron stars would not be the natural natural place to look at. Then you might you might turn your attention to lattice simulations. But there, of course, we have problem that is the sign problem in uh, uh, at, uh, at finite baryon chemical potential. Uh, well, one QCD-like theory that where we don't have a problem at finite chemical potential is QCD at non-zero isospin density. 
And this has been on for a long time, thanks to Son and Stefano, that, that this theory is free of the sign problem. And that's, uh, that gave rise to, to interest in, in its phase diagram. The physics is very different because uh, once you crank up a, a finite isospin chemical potential, then when the pot potential is larger than pi mass, you get Bose condensation of charged pions. So here, here's just a snapshot that I borrowed, phase diagram I borrowed from, from this lattice proceedings paper where you have temperature versus, chem versus density, not chemical potential. And you expect to have a large phase carrying a condensate of charged pions here, okay? That's basically triggered by the chemical potential and it carries isospin density. All the wavy lines here that are, there they are some extra, there are some extrapolations based on lattice simulations, but as, as long as analytical results are available, the lattice results are in agreement with, uh, with chiral perturbation theory up to next to leading order. So there's, there's a little, little tail in red here. Now, of course, we need the magnetic field and the problem with isospin chemical potential is that when you have isospin chemical potential and magnetic field, then you reintroduce the sign problem. Nevertheless, it's, it's quite interesting to look at this theory because you expect very interesting physics uh, to happen here. Uh, and one reason for that is, well, your, your pine condensate here that, you, that, that, that just arises from isospin chemical potential being large enough, uh, carries electric charge because it's charged by us. And so when you crank, crank up magnetic field, well, this becomes a superconductor. It's a charged, it's charged matter, electrically charged. So this becomes superconducting. And that's interesting physics because making magnetic field sufficiently strong, you expect type two superconductivity and you expect a of vortex lattice. Uh, on the other hand, now, uh, based on what I what I showed you previously, you might expect that sufficiently strong magnetic fields might also trigger the formation of the chirosoliton lattice, which carries neutral pion condensate. And so the question is, okay, then uh, is there's going to be some kind of competition between these two very interesting inhomogeneous orders, that is the chirosoliton lattice and the upper of vortex lattice. And that's what, what we studied with my master's student, uh, Martin Grönli, uh, a year ago. Uh, one complication here is that you absolutely have to make the magnetic fields dynamical. You can no longer treat the magnetic field as a fixed external background because otherwise you would get the physics of the superconducting phase completely wrong. <laughs> you need to solve self-consistently for the dynamical magnetic field together with the condensate. And it's something that you really uh, can only do numerically. Um, so I will not bother you with any, with any details. I'll just show you the, the result here. So here is a, a picture of phase diagram here. I switched to H. H means the external magnetic field that you keep fixed, whereas the magnetic field that's inside, that's of, that's, uh, that has to be solved for self-consistently. And here is the isospin chemical potential. So at 140, you have onset of charge pion condensation that will be normally down here. But as soon as you crank out the magnetic field, something happens. So, so along the, the sort of little, very, very, very thin wide stretch along the chemical potential axis, you see the good old uniform charge pion condensate. But the relatively weak magnetic fields immediately kill it and bring you to the phase that carries the abricos of vortex lattice. So this, the, the, the transition from, from the uniform condensate to the, to the abricos of vortex lattice is something one can treat relatively uh, analytically. So there's some formulas here, but never mind, okay? On the other hand, if you just completely ignore the charge pine condensate, you find that somewhere up there, you find the chiral soliton lattice. And again, the transition from the vacuum to chiral soliton lattice, that's easy. I showed that to you before in QCD uh, with barring chemical potential. What's really difficult and what, what requires some hard, hard numerical work is the transition, is the competition of the two phases. That's a first order transition. You, you don't have any simplification based on you know, any assumption of some order parameter being small or something. You really have to have to do brute force computation of the free energies, the Gibbs energies of the two different orders and, and compare them. And it's what you find here. So you have a very large domain of the phase diagram, which carries uh, the abricots of lattice of charged pion condensate. Then you have a uh, part of phase diagram that carries the chirosoliton lattice with the neutral pion condensate. And the two condensates repel each other. So they don't coexist. You have either charged pion or the neutral pion condensate, but not, not both. From the picture, you can see here that there is some kind of critical minimum magnetic field and that's, that corresponds to this triple point here where you, where that you need to, to, to cross to get a chiral soliton lattice. And that's something like 0.8 GV squared here. Right? 
So in this case, you cannot make the magnetic field arbitrarily weak by going close enough to the chiral limit, because you still have to take into account the competition with the with the uh, with the abricose of vortex lattice phase. So that's uh, that's uh, that's this bit. And uh, in the last couple of minutes, let me very quickly flash here uh, a similar application. Now I said, well. QCD with isotopic chemical potential is interesting because it's free of the sign problem, but then whoops, the magnetic field reintroduces the sign problem. So the question is, well, is there some theory where you can have both the chemical potential and magnetic field and still have no sign problem? So that in principle, you could study the, the you could study in homogeneous order on the lattice. And the answer is yes. Uh, what you can do is that you turn your attention, I'm sorry, to theories which are QCD-like in the sense that you have you change your gauge group and you change the representation in which the quarks sit so that the quarks sit in a real or pseudo real representation. Mm -hmm. Typical example would be two color QCD. So replace SU3 with SU2, uh, fundamental representation that's pseudo real, or Q, uh, quarks in the edge representation that's real, or some people like the G2 gauge group. It has all representations are real, so that makes you happy. Uh, again, the physics of these theories is very different because now you can make a baryon out of two quarks. When when quarks sit in a real representation, you can pick, you can put two quarks together to get a baryon. So now baryons are bosons. So you have you know either mesons are are are, are bosons or baryons are bosons, and you have competition of two kind of condensates. You know either baryonic or mesonic if you want. Um, turns out that in the, in this whole class of theories, you can make it free of the sign problem in simultaneous presence of baryon chemical potential and magnetic field, as long as you adjust the electric charges of the two flavors of quarks. So you need the charges to have equal magnitude and opposite sign. If you do this, then you're happy, then you have no sign problem. And in principle, it means that these kind of theories, you can study the, the, the presence of the chirosolids on lattice or on the lattice <laughs> in principle. I'm not saying that it's easy. Uh, but in principle, it should be possible without a sign problem. This is also interesting uh, uh, from a uh, for a different reason because uh, back in 2001, uh, here these gentlemen here, Ken Splitov, Damson, and Michel Stefanov, conjectured by basically looking at different types of orders, different types of um, Cooper pairing orders in different theories. They conjectured that there is a relation between the presence or absence of the sign problem and appearance of uh, inhomogeneous phase in a phase diagram. So somehow by, by having a sort of uh, enumerating a list of known examples of theories and coming up with some others, they conjectured that as long as your theory doesn't have a sign problem, that is the Dirac determinant, the, the determinant of the Dirac operator is, is positive, uh, you cannot have an inhomogeneous phase in a, fa in a phase diagram. This would be very interesting because you know, no go theorems for breaking of symmetries are very rare, and this would be a kind of no go theorem relating some relatively technical property that is the absence of a sign problem to breaking of translation invariance. Um, so, well, um, I can tell you that the conjecture is disproved now. So, that's the last thing I'll tell you. And this is work that we have done together with my PhD student, Georgios Filios and Helena Koleshova, whom I also mentioned, I already mentioned previously. This is a phase diagram of the class of real and serial theories, where you have vacuum, of course, at small chemical potential. Then you have a condensate. Now this time, not of charged pions, but here condensate of dike works. We have a baryon chemical potential. And mm -hmm. when that exceeds the, the vacuum mass of pions, the dike works, that is the, 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 the baryons start condensing. At the same time, at sufficiently strong magnetic fields, you can have this chirosoliton lattice phase. And well, turns out that 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 phase survives, and uh, in theories which are in principle testable, uh, which one can study on the lattice, one will still have this phase, which is inhomogeneous. So that disproves the conjecture that that split off Son and Stefan have made can, can back in two thousand one. Yes. Uh, uh, so of course uh, the scalar dike work in this two color theory are also yep. masses. So your chiral Lagrangian with pions alone is not correct, right? You need to include yeah, sure. pions and dike work. So you you did everything here, right? Yeah, yeah. So so they, the in the in vacuum, the dike work is the same mass as the pions. That's that's why what I call m pi. Okay, they have all the same mass, 
uh, and uh, you have to extend the carbon perturbation theory because the flavor symmetry is different. So for two quark flavors, the, fla the you no, long no longer have chiral symmetry, SU2 left cross, SU2 right cross, U1 baryon, but you right. have a flavor symmetry, which is SU4. Mm -hmm. And that spontaneously broken in pseudo real theories is broken down to SP4. In the real theories, it's broken down to SO4. The pseudo real are a bit simpler because then what you get is you find five goldstone bosons, which are three pions and the diquark and the anti diquark and so that's basically you have the competition of those. Thanks to my choice of electric, electric charges, the dike work is neutral, electrically mm -hmm. neutral. And so that's why you have, uh, this actually is a superfluid. You don't have to bother with, you know, dynamical magnetic field because this is ordinary uh, electrically neutral superfluid. And that order, which is uniform superfluid order competes with the chirosoliton lattice carrying the neutral pion condensate. We have done all that. And uh, the result of that analysis is that, well, the two orders compete and at some point when magnetic fields become strong enough, you just out, you just go into the CSL phase. Okay, but that's very specific choice. Yes, that yes, yes of, of course. I mean, the, the motivation there was really to come up with an example of the theory, which in principle is free of sign problem and so could be studied on the lattice, where you could have, you know, an example of a theory with an inhomogeneous order that in principle could be studied on the lattice. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, I will skip. I will skip one slight technical detail on this, and I will jump to uh, to my conclusions because I'm running out of time. So I everything I've been telling you here was basically work that I have done together with my collaborators. Naoki Yamamoto was absolutely crucial because with whom we did the original work, and then Helena Koleshova, uh, Georgios Filius, and Martin Grönli. There were other people, other groups who have worked on on the same. So one thing that's very interesting from the point of view of uh, Hevine collisions is in principle, you have the same effect if you replace magnetic field with rotation. And it's of course is known already in mechanics that to some extent rotation and magnetic fields have the, have very similar physics. And so it turns out that if you take QCD without magnetic field and you make it rotate, um, you can also trigger a transition to a, to a state which is a chirosoliton lattice. It depends what configuration exactly you you choose. You have different types of condensate. So uh, here, if you you can have still a condensate of neutral pions, but that in presence of rotation turns out to require to have two different chemical potentials. So both for baryon number and isospin. If you want only one chemical potential, you still you can still make it. But then what what turns out to condense is not neutral pions, but the eta mesons. So this is some this is some closely related work that was done in the last couple of years, and finally the last thing is that uh, earlier this year, uh, people in Japan have uh, tried to answer the question that's very natural in this context, and that is uh, well if I if I claim that I have a state of matter which carries barrier number but is not made of nucleons, so how can I actually create such state of matter? So so there are two groups simultaneously here and independently, as far as I know, they they try to they try to look at the dynamical formation of the chirosoliton lattice, basically the dynamics of the transition uh, through basically quantum tunneling. So quantum nucleation of, of a domain wall, which would be first finite, so a kind of disk domain wall, which would be surrounded by a, by a vortex, vortex ring. And the, well, the initial results that, uh, that were published are not terribly uh, optimistic from our point of view. So it turns out that for the magnetic fields that are of the range that I've been showing you here, it appears that the, the nucleation rate still is exponentially suppressed. One would need to crank out the magnetic field farther up by a factor of few, let's say, to, to, to kill that exponential suppression of the nucleation of the domain walls. Uh, but uh, perhaps this is something that, that require, will require some further studies because the two groups that, as far as I know, they use some rather simple, uh, simple estimates. Uh, but that's, uh, that's really all I wanted to tell you. Uh, so. I'll just flash here my my summary. Where, uh, in comparison to what do uh, to the mechanisms for for generation of inhomogeneous order that I showed you uh, showed at the in the first part of my talk, uh, the the formation of the chirosoliton lattice is a new types of new type of mechanism, which uh, which is based on linear coupling between some uh, between some pseudo scalar field and a background field, which is magnetic field in our case. Uh, the name chirosoliton lattice was not coined by us. It already exists in condensed matter, and one has this kind of phase, which is mathematically pretty identical in in magnets, uh, in uh, in in chiral magnets. But uh, so this uh, the realization in QCD uh, that's uh, that's new, and that was the subject of my talk. Of course, if there were any other realizations of the same generic mechanism, 
how you could how we could create a solid on lattice state in, in quantum matter that will of course be extremely interesting. But I'll stop here because I'm running out of time and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for a very nice presentation. So we'll go to questions now. So if you have questions, please raise your hands and um, I'll take them in the order of, uh, uh, of the hands. Um, I want to start with the first question since I don't see any hand yet. Um, as you may know, uh, I was always uh, trying to understand a little bit better the, the mechanism that leads to this sub critical value of the bearing chemical potential formation of matter the, the 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 naive the naive idea is that it seems almost like magical so one place that i'm thinking is kind of uh, requires a little bit of additional digging is the um, the assumption of the carl perturbation theory uh -huh. essentially you are taking f pi and m pi as those in vacuum now, in the presence of a very strong magnetic field, both are supposed to be growing with the magnetic field. And as far as I understand, that will basically possibly even remove this possibility of the coral salt and lattice. Is that true? Um, so, so again, so that depends. Um, uh, so uh, first of all, as I said before, um, if you just play the game that let's forget about phenomenology and just play the game, okay, does, is this phase, can it exist in the parameter space of QCD? Then you can just tune close enough to Kyrie limit. And then, you know, a set, it makes the onset magnetic field arbitrarily small. And in that case, you don't have to worry about any dependence of MPI on FPI on magnetic field because you basically are so close to vacuum that that, uh, that the dependence is just, you know, doesn't, doesn't matter. Of course, uh, this question that you raised was very relevant for this work that we did uh, uh, on QCD-like theories, because there it turns out that unlike in QCD itself, where this transition between the CSL and vacuum is hyper, it's a hyperbola, you know, so it, you can think of making mu sufficiently large, and then if, even if you keep MPI fixed by making mu sufficiently large, you can make the magnetic field that's needed small. But in this case, that's not true anymore. So if for the QCD-like theory, because you have the competition with the dichroic condensate, the, the, the transition curve here saturates and goes to some finite limit. So you really need, you have some threshold magnetic field, which even in the car limit, you have to get a, get over. And uh, so, so there, it was a very relevant question. And so that's why I, I didn't mention it because it is slightly technical, but in that, in that work here that I mentioned here, we actually took into account as at least as a matter of principle, the dependence of M pi and of F pi on magnetic field. And we needed some input, and so we we used we use basically existing one loop results, you know, for 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 the B dependence of F pi, and we could show that for theories for some some of the QCD like theories at least uh, the the value of the magnetic field that's needed to cross this transition is under the control of the derivative expansion of chiral perturbation theory. And so which theories that is? Well, I skipped that bit. So here it says theories with large enough D. So I have to tell you what D is. D is the dimension of the rep representation of the gauge group in which a single uh, quark flavor transforms in. So let's say for fundamental SU3, D would be three. Uh, three is not large enough. Uh, so we, we looked at two color QCD where D is two, and that's even worse. And the two color QCD really is a marginal case where we can only claim that the presence of the CSL phase here is consistent with what we know about the B dependence of F pi, but we can't really make a you know, claim conclusively that one can actually reach the magnetic, ma magnetic fields needed for the transition. But you can imagine theories where you, you just think you just take a sufficiently large gauge group, a sufficiently large representation in which the quarks sit. You need large enough gauge group in order that you know the large number of fermion degrees of freedom doesn't take you out of the confining phase. <laughs> so you need to simultaneously take large gauge group and a large representation in which the quarks sit. And the gauge group doesn't really matter, but the, the, the representation in which quarks sit that affects that makes it D large. So if you think of some kind of large D expansion, it turns out that the corrections, the, the, the B dependent correction to F pi is, can, be, can be made uh, very small. It goes mm -hmm. like one over D basically, effectively, the one loop correction to the critical magnetic field. So then one can actually trust the leading order prediction that, that we made. And, and, and again, you are safe. If you go to theories like two color QCD one, we would really need input on what this function actually looks like beyond, beyond the loop expansion. 
So we right. would need some kind of interpolation between the perturbative loop expansion and the large B limit, which is what, what we found in your review with, uh, with Miransky. Okay. Oh. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, you, you, you definitely address many of the concerns. <laughs> so anyway, there are other questions. Uh, Xingyang, please. Uh, hi, thanks for the very nice talk. <clears throat> I have a question about it. In the end, they are talking about in the future, we can do uh, things in the rotation. But I have a very general question. Maybe I'm stupid, but uh, there are many paper uh, regarding rotation in high one collision. But the thing is, they are all doing the things in the rotation frame. And I didn't find any, uh, any paper give a uh, conclusion how to trans uh, transfer the result to the live frame. So we couldn't compare the result in the rotation frame with observations. And this, uh, oh, in fact, there are several papers about uh, the things in the uh, in live frame with rotation, but the Lagrange seems incorrect. In fact, Eager also have a paper regarding that, but uh, we know that uh, Hamilton, uh, the Lagrange is uh, problematic. So okay. do you have any command on how um, to... I'm mm. afraid I'm afraid not, uh, because I have not done these studies myself. So I said the, the works already exist. Okay, they here you, the, these are references. So if you just look for uh, Huang Nishimura Yamamoto, so that was the original work, uh, and then uh, Nishimura and Yamamoto they did the same thing with East Amazon condensation. I I don't know the, all the details of how they have done that. Um, uh, so unfortunately, I don't think I can answer that question. Whether there is something wrong with their with their approach or not, um, that is the the of course the the the, uh, the the rotation enters through through the metric, so not not only through the anomaly, uh, in that case. So that's why the 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 two cases are not exactly equivalent: the magnetic field and rotation. Uh, but as to whether there's any problem with implementing the rotation, I I don't really know. Sorry. Okay. Uh, next question, Thomas. Go ahead. Yeah. Hello, Thomas. Hi. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> nice to see you again. <laughs> yeah. So uh, my question, uh, can, can you show you uh, show me the plot, uh, the dependence uh, K over the B? So yes. uh, elliptic, elliptic. Here, here. Yes, here. Yeah. Yeah. So as, as I remember, uh, K value has mm -hmm. two edges. So one yep. and zero. Yep. So if, if it uh, equals to zero, it looks like a simple sine or cosine. And mm -hmm. if it's yep. uh, equals to one, it uh, looks like... Um, That's a domain wall. The hype, uh, yeah, ta ta tangents, yeah? Yeah, uh, yeah. So can you, um, can you comment what's going on in physical uh, language? So why, yes. mm -hmm. why in... Uh, and and does it um, is it true that on, without a uh, magnetic field it's look like a domain wall? Yeah. Um, so you need the magnetic field to stabilize the domain wall. Otherwise, of course, the domain mm -hmm. wall exists as the solution to the equation of motion, no matter mm -hmm. what. Because the because the because the the anomaly term in Hamilton doesn't affect the equation of motion. It's it's a surface term. So all the solutions with any k they exist, even at even in zero magnetic field. But if you ask what is the ground state, what is the lowest energy state, then of course that's where the magnetic field and chemical potential enter through the through the uh, anomaly. Otherwise, these two limits that you mentioned. So uh, you can think of the k goes to zero limit. For instance, if you look at this parameter here. You can uh, you can think of that as corresponding, for instance, either to making you know b large or mu large or, or making m pi small. So when you go to chiral limit, when you go to chiral limit, you basically approach that state with k going to zero, where as you said, you have a sine or cosine. Well, in the in the language of my field, I call phi. That just means that phi is linear. It's a linear function of coordinate. Yeah. But if you translate it into what the actual quark bilinears look like, that means that you have a chiral condensate and you have the pion, neutral pion condensate and you have a kind of spiral. This is really just the chiral density wave. Okay? Yeah. The, the CSL density. state, when you go to the chiral limit, is identical with the chiral density wave state. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. The opposite limit, so that uh, when k goes to one, that really corresponds to a single domain wallet. This is the solution. Okay, you can see it here. Actually, it's very simple. <laughs> no Jacobi elliptic functions or something. Yeah. yeah. So that that's it. Uh, this is well known. Also. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Okay. Next question, uh, Graziano Milato, please go ahead. Okay. Uh, thank you for your talk. What are what are the mathematical expressions of the magnetic uh, and electric fields that you have obtained? Did you show them? Have they been experimentally uh, verified? So I assume here that the magnetic field is a fixed constant uniform background. So I don't have any electric field because I don't think I don't think of electromagnetism as a dynamical. It's, this is just QCD in a fixed background, fixed magnetic background. Uh, now, if you ask how big the magnetic field should be, so that was on the phase diagram picture that I showed here in in the, let's say, more commonplace units, 0.1 here, here, this is roughly 10 to 19 Gauss. Okay, so then you ask, you may ask the question, so if you just don't just want to be you know, formal and ask, okay, can we reach such fields in nature? Uh, It appears that the answer depends who you ask. Uh, um, so, uh, if you so if you say if you think of neutron stars, uh, typically when when you talk to astrophysicists, they they would tell you that you are crazy, uh, that this is like several way, several orders of magnitude beyond like what you might hope to see in magnetars. I Igor might know better, but I would guess that there the the optimistic guess would be somewhere around ten to fifteen Gauss. On the other hand. There are some people in the QCD community who claim that if if the magnetic field somehow the dynamics of generating magnetic fields is QCD based, then then it would be natural to have the fields of close to the QCD scale. So the 10 to 19 might be hoped for. Um, I try to avoid this question because I would I would be very, on very thin ice there. Uh, um, it, it, one thing that I didn't say that if you sort of play the game and assume, well, okay, can we actually can such fields exist in neutron stars? Interestingly, you might ask yourself, well, what is the baryon number density that the CSL state would carry, right? Because then, well, I'm claiming here that you have a new state of baryon method. And <laughs> okay, what is the density? And it turns out that I don't have a plot in this slide in this talk, but you can you can calculate that and you find that you can actually quite easily reach within the parameter space I'm showing it to you. You can quite easily reach density several times the nuclear saturation density. So it's kind of you know dense, the density itself is in the right ballpark. Uh, the, the only question is whether the magnetic fields one could actually hope to see that will be this big. And so uh, I can't. They certainly haven't been seen. <laughs> so in that sense, uh, the, uh, yeah. I'm not sure if the answer your answer your question. Okay, I, I guess I, I since you you mentioned something about me, I, I guess I could add <laughs> one little thing that potentially why astrophysicists are kind of often uh, skeptical about these things because essentially the redistribution of the energy density between the magnetic and the matter part and finding sort of a natural mechanism that could generate such huge magnetic fields that are basically larger than the energy density in the matter. Is, is kind of by itself a bit um, difficult, but, but yeah. Um, I, I don't see any raised hands, but I, I did uh, see that there is one question uh, that I have unanswered. Um, uh, when you are studying from the vacuum, it's sort of slightly related to the previous question. You're essentially saying that the magnetic field is not too strong so that we could stick with the pion masses and the uh, decay constants like in the vacuum. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you are saying that the pi plus and pi minus are sufficiently heavy that you could neglect them already. Yep. So that drives natural question. If you are studying from uh, the field where the magnetic is not so strong to modify pi masses, perhaps you should include pi plus, pi minus, even in the lowest order description, and maybe they would also affect the CSO? Um, so... You can you can also include the charge bands in a game uh, again within the scheme that that we, that we use where we treat empire as a constant and you find that you know I mean this is the, this is the phase diagram that you find simply okay so where you have neutral pine condensate here and then here you get here that condensate becomes unstable 
but, yes, but essentially I'm, I'm talking about the lower line and basically assuming yeah. that we are not considering just like that simplest effective theory or effective theory but the the, the full the full uh, set of degrees of freedom you still get roughly same solution right it doesn't yes, modify yeah. no, but isn't that because you are looking only mean field essentially it's it's all leading order of course I mean, mean field, I mean, it's leading order in, and, and we have already also done the one loop, you know, calculation. So in principle, one can calculate corrections, right? And and uh, as I mentioned to, to to when I was answering the question by Tamash, the, all the solutions are independent of magnetic field in principle, right? So it's just only their energy. That's where the magnetic field enters, but the solutions themselves are unchanged. Right, right, right. Okay, okay, good. So uh, any other questions, last call before we close uh, for questions? Okay, um, uh, since I don't see anybody, I would like to use this opportunity to thank you, uh, to thank uh, Thomas uh, for a very nice presentation, engaging, thank you. and um, thanks.